Good morning, everyone, and welcome to uh, Cedar Creek Message here on Easter Sunday. I'll admit it's been a really weird couple of weeks um, with the shelter in place order and the limit on gatherings greater than 10 people or 10 or greater, and just all the things that have been happening around, happening around our country and our world. It's just been really strange. And if you guys have been tuning in to any of Robin Mind's podcasts or some of the 10 minute devotionals, you've probably heard me talk a little bit about how this has been a difficult transition for many of us, and myself included. Uh, it has been really interesting to try to adjust to a new way of life here at church and what I do in my day to day job and at home with my family. And I imagine for many of you it has been um, similar uh, to, uh, to that, that it has been a difficult thing to adjust to being limited on where we can go and who we can interact with and and so know you're not alone know that there are other people out there who are wrestling through this today I went through or I went on a prayer walk just wrestling through how as a as a people we can love each other well in this in this time of isolation and how we can reach out to each other and things that we can do um, to show each other that we love each other and, and display Christ's love to each other. And so, um, no, you're not alone. No, you're not alone. And I encourage you, if you haven't listened to some of those things that uh, Rob and I have done or some of the 10-minute devotionals, uh, please uh, tune in and check them out. And hopefully, God has something for you there that can uh, encourage you and build you up and, and help you um, in this time of difficulty. So with that, I'm excited this morning to give the Easter message. Um, we put together this teaching series long before any of this happened. In fact, Rob and Mark and I and Matt had sat down and started working through the teaching schedule for this year late last year, and we really uh, hammered and refined it out in January. And so we had the opportunity to, to put this five-part Holy Week series together back then. And so I've known for, well, it's April, so almost four months that I was going to be doing this Easter message. And so it's given me the opportunity, the privilege, and the blessing to be able to really study and dig into this text. So today we're going to be focusing on Mark uh, chapter 15, verse 21 through chapter 16, verse 8. And I've had a lot of time to ponder how is what happened 2,000 years ago really applicable to me today? And what can I draw from the text and what can I draw from the characters in this story that really help me grow as an individual? And so I've been really excited to be able to, to pour into that, um, to that scripture. And so that's been really good for me. Um, and I hope that what God has taught me in this time would be beneficial uh, for all of you as well. And so here we are in Mark 15, 21 through 16, 8, and we're witnessing one of the most pivotal, the most pivotal event in human history, the crucifixion and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And that is just wonderful for us to be able to take our eyes off of everything that's going on in this world right now and focus on our Savior. And I'm really excited to be able to walk through this text with you today. So before we really dig into this, I just want to pray over our time here, as weird as that is, because I'm recording this before um, you're actually viewing it, but I want to pray over this and, and pray for pray for us. So let's let's bow our heads in prayer here. Uh, Heavenly Father, um, I'm grateful um, to be able to talk about what you have done for us, and I am grateful for the opportunity um, to to attempt to watch over your people, and I'm grateful for your word that instructs and guides me, and it instructs and guides all of us as we turn and look to you. And so I pray this morning, as we dive into this scripture, this chunk of um, scripture, Lord, that you would really bring it to life for us, and that you would help us understand what it is that we can learn um, from this. And God, I pray that we would, as we turn our eyes to you this morning, that we would be encouraged by the grace that you've displayed for us, and that we would be built up by your word and your truth, and that we would have a new experience with you um, through, um, through the Bible, Lord, through you speaking to us, your Holy Spirit moving in our hearts and our minds. And so I lift up this recording to you. I lift up this time that I get um, to spend with you and the, the time that um, people are spending to, to listen to this, Lord. So I, I thank you. I thank you that you're, you are working 
in our hearts and minds and that you're helping us grow uh, as people. So we lift up this time to you in Jesus' name. Amen. So as is normal for me, I really like to start off a message just reading through the entirety of the portion of scripture that we're going to be going through. And so what I'm going to do here is I've got uh, Mark chapter 15 opened up. Uh, and I have, this is the English Standard Version, the ESV. I would like to read through uh, Mark 15, 21 through 16, 8. And then we'll talk about um, some observations that I pulled out of the text here and some of the things that we can learn from what is happening here. So uh, let's begin. Mark 15, 21 through 16, 8. And they compelled a passerby, Simon of Cyrene, who is coming in from the country, the father of Alexander and Rufus, to carry his cross. And they brought him to the place called Golgotha, which means place of a skull. And they offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it. And they crucified him and divided his garments among them, casting lots for them, to decide what each should take. And it was the third hour when they crucified him. And the inscription of the charge against him read, The King of the Jews. And with him they crucified two robbers, one on his right and one on his left. And those who passed by derided him, saying, wagging their heads and saying, Aha, you who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself and come down from the cross. So also the chief priests with the scribes mocked him to one another, saying, He saved others. He cannot save himself. Let the Christ, the King of Israel, come down now from the cross that we may see and believe. Those who were crucified with him also reviled him. And when the sixth hour had come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of the bystanders, hearing it, said, Behold, he's calling Elijah. And someone ran and filled a sponge with sour wine, put it on a reed, and gave it to him to drink, saying, Wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to take him down. And Jesus uttered a loud cry and breathed his last. And the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And when the centurion, who stood facing him, saw that in this way he breathed his last, he said, Truly this man was the Son of God. There were also women looking on from a distance, among whom were Mary Magdalene, and Mary the mother of James the younger, and of Joseph and Salome. When he was in Galilee, they followed him and ministered to him, and there were also many other women who came up with him to Jerusalem. And when evening had come, since it was the day of preparation, that is, the day before the Sabbath, Joseph of Arimathea, a respected member of the council, who was also himself looking for the kingdom of God, took courage and went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Pilate was surprised to hear that he, would have, he should have already died. And summoning the centurion, he asked him, asked him whether he was already dead. And when he learned from the centurion that he was dead, he granted the corpse to Joseph. And Joseph bought a linen shroud, and taking him down, wrapped him in the linen shroud, and laid him in a tomb that had been cut out of the rock. And he rolled a stone against the entrance of the tomb. Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of Joseph saw where he was laid. When the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Salome, brought spices so that, they, so that they might go and anoint him. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb, and they were saying to one another, Who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance of the tomb? And looking up, they saw that the stone had been rolled back, and it was very large. And entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, dressed in a white robe, and they were alarmed. And he said to them, Do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter that he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. And they went out and fled from the tomb, for trembling and astonishment had seized them. And they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. Wow, there's a, a lot going on in this text as we went through and uh, read through the whole chunk, Mark 15, 21 through 16, 8. And, and there's a lot 
happening. There's a lot I would love to talk about it, and I know that um, we have limited time here, so there's just a few things I want to point out as, as we kind of pick a few pieces of text up out of here. And, and so to set the stage just a little bit to remind us, what happened last week at the very end is Jesus was flogged. He was whipped by a uh, instrument of torture called a cat of nine tails. It's a, it's a whip with braided cords where pieces of glass and metal and stone are embedded in it and it beats into a person's flesh and bruises them deeply and um, they often go into shock and they have a lot of blood loss. And so Jesus was flogged and then he was redressed in his clothes and so now, now he is being led out through the streets of Jerusalem. And so we see here, we pick up in verse 21 where it says, And they compelled a passerby, Simon of Cyrene, who is coming from the country, to carry his cross. So we see this man, Simon of Cyrene, who was compelled to carry Jesus' cross. And, and I want to point that, that out, that word compelled. Simon was forced. He was forced to carry Jesus' cross. Likely just the cross bar, not the whole um, T but likely just the crossbar. And so we see he was compelled. Well, why was he forced to do it? Well, Jesus was so physically beaten, my guess is that Jesus wasn't capable of carrying that cross. And so they had to compel, they had to force a passerby, this man, to carry it for him. See, the, the Romans were really good at execution and humiliation, and so it would seem really fitting I think, for them to have flogged Jesus and then to force him to actually carry his instrument of torture through the streets of Jerusalem to the place of his impending death. But I don't think Jesus was physically capable of doing that, and so they actually had to make somebody else do it for him. And you might be wondering, well, why in the world would would, uh, would Justin bring this up? Why is this important? So they forced some guy to carry his cross because he couldn't. Well, I think that Looking at that really sets a scene for us as Christians to understand that Jesus, well, what Jesus had gone through. See, Jesus had been, he'd been flogged and he'd been so tortured that he couldn't actually carry this any longer. And it sets the scene that this man who was a carpenter, who was very likely very physically capable of doing this, couldn't endure something like carrying a piece of timber across the streets of Jerusalem up to Golgotha, the place of the skull. And so let's, let's keep going on here. And so I, I think that's important and that's, that's interesting, but let's keep going on here. And so we have Mark 15, 23, it says, And they offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it. And they crucified him, in verse 24, And they crucified him and divided his garments from among them, casting lots for them to decide what each should take. And so in those first couple words, and they, and they crucified him. Well, what did that look like? Well, as many of us have seen the movie The Passion of the Christ, many of us have seen other renditions of it, but Jesus was escorted up this place, Golgotha, the place of the skull. He was escorted up this hill, and Simon was carrying that crossbar, and that crossbar was now affixed to the rest of the cross. And, it, and you know, we think, you know, we, we can think, oh, well, it's a piece of wood. Maybe we imagine a piece of fresh cut timber like we would pick up from the hardware store, but, but wood, as my understanding is, wood was a commodity back then, and it was something that was fairly expensive, and so this cross very likely had been used in countless other executions. So the cross bar that Simon was carrying was marred. It was beaten. There were hammer marks from previous execution. There were hole marks from where nails had previously been drill, uh, driven into it. There was likely blood and other human bodily fluids staining the surface. And so this thing was likely gross. Maybe it even stunk a little bit. And Jesus was laid across it, and his hands and his feet were nailed to the cross. This nasty piece of wood. And then the Roman soldiers would have had to lift it up and drop that into a hole. And so Jesus' body would have jolted as he fell down into place. And then what startles me a little bit more than that, we see here, they divided his garments among them. They divided his garments among them. Well, if they're dividing his garments, it means he's not wearing them. That means he was likely stripped right before this. So adding to Jesus' physical abuse and torture is social humiliation. He's likely naked. Maybe he's in a loincloth, but or you know, a, a, his underwear or something. But he's likely hanging from this piece of wood, 
naked. And, and the men are dividing his garments amongst them. And then another thing that catches my eye, it says they, they cast lots for them to decide what each should take. They cast lots for his clothes to decide what each should take. So picture this scene. Jesus is hanging on a cross. And these soldiers who had just nailed him to it and dropped him into place have turned their gaze off of this atrocity, off of this execution of this man. And they're focused on his clothing. And it's not nice clothing either. We know that he was undressed for the flogging and then he was flogged and then redressed and walked through the streets of Jerusalem. These clothes are filthy. They're covered in blood. They're gross. They're rags at this point. And so they're casting lots over rags. These men have taken their eyes off of Jesus and they're focusing on filthy rags. And it's easy for me as I read this to think, wow, and, and want to judge them for this, for this sin. For them losing sight of the eternal and, and casting their eyes on something temporary. But, but the reality is, is I think I myself and many of us, if not all of us, have done the very, this very same thing. We've lost sight so many times in our lives of our Savior who's hanging on a cross for our sins. And we focused on something temporary. And we have traded like these Roman soldiers riches of our Savior Jesus for rags for bloody rags that won't bring satisfaction, that won't bring us happiness. And we get focused on the temporary and we get lost in that. And I, so often in my life I found myself like these men, focused on something that doesn't ultimately satisfy and lost sight of my Savior hanging on the cross for my sins. And so I think we have to be careful not to judge these men because as we read through this story and we look at all these different people, we can see ourselves in this story and how we too are guilty of the same things and how Jesus in all of this is forgiving them throughout it. And in the account of Luke, while this is happening, while these men are casting lots for his filthy clothes, Jesus prays over them. I have it written down here. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. While... These Roman soldiers are, are throwing dice down to see who gets his stuff. Jesus prays over them, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And so when we're doing that in our lives, when we've turned our eyes from our Savior, when we've turned our eyes from the Christ, from our Messiah, from Jesus, from God, and we've traded the eternal for the temporary, we can experience that same forgiveness from our God. Jesus is actively praying over these soldiers in their sin. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And I find that so deeply moving that when I am in sin in my home or I'm in sin with my kids or I'm in sin at work or I'm in sin anywhere in my life, that my God is in the active business of actively forgiving me for those sins things just like Jesus was hanging on that cross. So no matter where you're at in your life right now, he is praying a similar thing. He is, our God has that same feeling. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And I think that's just an incredible thing that despite this, our God is in the business of forgiveness. Even when we're in sin, our God is in the business of forgiveness. So let's carry on here. In Mark 15, 25, and it was the third hour when they crucified him. So it was the third hour when they crucified him. That was, that's 9 a.m. And we know Jesus has been up all night. He was bounced back and forth between the high priests and Pontius Pilate and all this stuff is going on. He's been up all night. And now it's 9 o'clock in the morning. He's already been flogged and walked through the city and he's hanging from a tree. And it, and it keeps going on here. And the inscription of the charge against him read, The King of the Jews. So after all this has occurred, we see very boldly displayed on the cross, on a sign above his head, it says, The King of the Jews. See, I think this is really important for us to take note of because it, it is put on display what Jesus was being crucified for. He claimed to be the King of the Jews. He claimed to be the Messiah. He made it so known to us who he was that there's just no denying it. In fact, in Mark 14, we saw the high priest ask him, Are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? And Jesus said, 
I am, and you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power, coming with the clouds of heaven. See, our God claimed to be the Messiah. It is written all throughout the Gospels that Jesus claimed to be the Christ, the Son of God, the Messiah, the one who had come to take away the sins of the world. It was written on the cross above him that he was the king of the Jews and so we see that it is so very clear to us in scripture that our God was who he claimed to be that he had come to save us from our sins and so sometimes we hear in this world around us people claim well Jesus never really claimed to be the Christ but in fact he did over and over and over and that is why he was being crucified and that is why he was being crucified and we also see that he's being reviled by the men around him as well. And so he's being mocked by the people around him. He's being mocked by the chief priests and the scribes. And he's being mocked by the two men who are actually guilty of being robbers and, and falling into sin. And so then we carry on here in Mark uh, 15, 33. And it says, And when the sixth hour had come, there was darkness over the whole land, until the ninth hour and it, so now it's the sixth hour so it's noon and now darkness has come over the whole land at noon which is odd normally it's not dark at noon and at the ninth hour Jesus cried out with a loud voice Eloi Eloi lama sabachthani which means my God my God why have you forsaken me so, so this is the first time we see Jesus saying anything since he's been put on the cross in, in the account of Mark here and he cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And so I want for us to take a look at what, what was Jesus getting at here? Why, why did Jesus cry out these things? And, and I pondered this for a while, um, and it dawned on me that Jesus is quoting Psalm 22 here. He's, he's quoting Psalm 22, so if you would, open up your Bibles to Psalm 22, or just listen. And I want to read here the first 18 verses of Psalm 22. And the reason I want to do this is because it, I think it tells us, it informs us the heart of Jesus as he is on the cross dying for our sins, what he is experiencing, what he is feeling, what he is going through. And so we can actually relate to him in this. And so here in Psalm 22, verses 1 through 18, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So those, that's the text that Jesus had said. Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me from the words of my groaning? Oh my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer. And by night, but I find no rest. Yet you are holy and throned on the praises of Israel. And you, our fathers, trusted. They trusted and you delivered them. To you they cried and were rescued. In you they trusted and were not put to shame. But I am a worm and not a man, scorned by mankind and despised by the people. All who see me mock me. They wag, or they make mouths at me. They wag their heads. He trusts in the Lord. Let him deliver them, him. Let him rescue him, for he delights in him. Yet you, you are he who took me from the womb. You made me trust you at my mother's breast. On you I was cast from my birth, and from my mother's womb you have been my God. Be not far from me, for trouble is near, and there is none to help. Many bulls encompass me. Strong bulls of Bashan surround me. They open wide their mouths at me like a ravening and roaring lion. I am poured out like water. All my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted within my breast. My strength is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue sticks to my jaws. You lay me in the dust of death. For dogs encompass me. A company of evildoers encircles me. They have pierced my hands and my feet. I can count all my bones, they stare and gloat over me, they divide my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. And so we see here in Psalm 22 the weight and the emotion of what is going on with Jesus, what he is experiencing and what he is feeling. And so I want to keep going here and in Mark and continue on before we run out of time. And so let's turn here to Mark 15, 37, where it says, And Jesus uttered a loud cry and breathed his last, and the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And that is so significant for us, because if we look back in Exodus 26, we see that the temple was put in 
the, the, the curtain was put in the temple to separate the people from the most holy, from our God's presence in the temple so that we wouldn't die. So that, that curtain was there to protect us, to separate us from God. And yet here upon Jesus' death, when he breathes his last, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. What that means for us is that Jesus removed the separation. He cut the curtain. He tore down the veil. He made it so that we could enter into a relationship with God. He removed our sins from us in that moment so that we could come into the presence of the Most Holy, which we weren't allowed or afforded to do before, and now we're able to. And that is just a wonderful thing. And so when we, when we look at that, I encourage you, if you have time today, go back to Exodus 26, 31 through 33, and you can see a little bit more about that, that curtain that was torn in two by God. And so I want here, in relation to that, I want to look here and, at Romans 8. And so at Romans 8, 31 through 39, and unfortunately, of course, I didn't mark this one. So I have to actually, you know, find it. Romans 8, 31. And what then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him get graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword, as it is written, for your sake we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present nor things to come, nor powers nor height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us in, from, from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. So when we read this text, we see here in Romans 8, nothing can separate us from our God. Nothing can separate us, not height nor depth. And that curtain, that veil has been torn on our behalf. And that is just so wonderful to, to take a look at that and see that in Mark, 5, Mark 15, that he, he removed what separated us from him. He tore it in half and he's removed our sins so we can enter back into relationship with him. And so I want to continue on here, flipping back to Mark 15. And so now we see Jesus has died and he has he has died on the cross. And we're going to turn here to Mark 15, 42 through 43. It says, And when evening had come, since it was the day of preparation, that is, the day before the Sabbath, Joseph of Marimathea, a respected member of the council, who was also looking for the kingdom of God, took courage and went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Okay, so evening has come, Jesus has died, and Joseph of Arimathea, a respected member of the council, he went to Pontius Pilate and he asked for Jesus' body. He had to take courage. See, Joseph was part of that same council that had condemned Jesus to death just back in chapter 14. He had to take courage because he was putting his, at least, at the very least, he's putting his respected status as a respected member of the council at risk, if not putting his life at risk for identifying with this man who claimed to be the Messiah. So he had to take courage. And as I was thinking about what Joseph does here, what he did here, I was thinking about how we can, we can take heed of what Joseph, Joseph's courage, and we can learn from him that even when we're surrounded by men and women who aren't following the Lord, when we're surrounded by men and women who are blinded by their own understanding, by the chief priests and scribes like Joseph was, we can learn from him that we can still be in a relationship with God, that we can still be seeking God's kingdom, that we can still be looking for him. And so I just love his example here because so often we find ourselves in the workplace surrounded by men and women who don't love Jesus. We find ourselves surrounded by people in our hobbies or various other avenues in our life or in our family perhaps that don't know the Lord. And yet in that circumstance, we can learn from Joseph Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And we, can, we can learn about those things. And, and so let's carry on here a little bit more about Joseph in verse 44. So Pilate was surprised to hear that he would have already died. And summoning the centurion, he asked him whether he was already dead. And he learned from the centurion that he was dead, granted the corpse to Joseph. 
So Joseph, he, he bought a linen shroud and taking him down, wrapped him in the linen shroud and laid him in a tomb that had been cut out of rock. We see Joseph go and get the body of Jesus up off that hill. And so I, I was thinking about this a little bit. So Joseph is a respected member of the council. That means that he probably had some money, he probably had some wealth, he had servants. And he could have sent a servant to go do this for him so that he wouldn't be seen having taken Jesus' body down and having been attributed to being the one who had done this. But no, Joseph took courage, not only asked Pontius Pilate for the body of Christ, but he also went to the place of Jesus' execution and took his body down and put himself on display for God. He didn't hide it. And I, I can't imagine how terrifying for him that would have been, knowing that he was putting his respected status as a member of the council at risk and perhaps even putting his life at risk and doing so boldly and publicly for everyone to see. And then even more so, I wonder, as he was wrapping Jesus' body in this linen shroud that he had just bought, as he was taking Jesus down off that cross, if he recognized that this was the body of his Savior that he was wrapping up and laying in a tomb, if he recognized that the man that he was carrying to this tomb was the one who died in his place, for his sins. I can't imagine it, you know, had I been in his shoes and recognized that, how deeply moving that would have been for me. So let's carry on here in Mark 16. And we see Mary and Magdalene, Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James and Salome, they brought spices and they've gone to the tomb to find Jesus' body. And we see another scripture that the Pharisees had gotten the Roman soldiers, gotten the Romans to uh, put soldiers out in front of Jesus' tomb so that nobody would steal his body. They were afraid that Jesus' body would go missing. And so there's soldiers in front of this tomb and the women had seen this. And so when they show up, they're not there and the stone is rolled away. And in another scripture we see that an angel came and rolled the stone away and frightened the soldiers and they fainted or ran off or both. And so I'm not sure if the women here are walking past fainted soldiers or if the soldiers have already run away but they're here now and they go to this tomb and they see that the stone has been rolled back and they see there's a uh, an angel a young man sitting in sitting on the right side dressed in a white robe and they're alarmed of course they're alarmed the soldiers are supposed to be there and the stone was supposed to be in front of the tomb and so they're frightened there's some random dude in white sitting there and, and so this angel says to them do not be alarmed you seek Jesus of Nazareth who was crucified he is risen, he is not here. See the place where they laid him, but go tell his disciples and Peter that he's going before you to Galilee. And see, now I love here in this text that the angel reminds the women of the promise that Jesus had made back in Mark 14. See, they, Jesus had told them in Mark 14, 28, he said, but after I am raised up, I will go before you to Galilee. And then Peter says, well, I won't fall away. And Jesus predicts, truly, truly, I say to you this very night, before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. So the angel reminds the women that Jesus is going before them to Galilee. He reminds them of Jesus' promises. And he even calls out here and tell Peter, he's going before you to Galilee. Now, if you guys had tuned in and heard Mark's message last week, Peter, Peter denied Jesus multiple times. And while Jesus is being uh, accused and flogged, Peter's denying him. And so Peter has, he's walked away from Christ. And yet we see here the angel of the Lord telling Peter through these women, I will keep my end of the promise. I will go before you to Galilee and you will see me there. And I just find that so comforting knowing that when I mess up, when I screw up, Jesus is still there forgiving me. He is still there keeping up his end of the bargain. And that's part of the, part of the gospel. We accept him as our Lord and Savior, and he will keep his end of the bargain. He has wiped us clean of every sin, past, present, and future, and we can stand on that just like Peter who denied Christ while he was going to the cross over and over and was predicted to have been done so. Jesus still forgave him, and Jesus reminds him of this truth. And I just love just love that even after Peter had denied Jesus multiple times, he reminds him of his promise and says, you know what, you can still come back to me. And so in 
this story, we see the love of God and the forgiveness of God and the grace of God coming through for us on our behalf, showing us that no matter what we do, no matter what we do, our God is in the business of forgiving us. And that's not so that we have just a blanket, uh, a blanket of grace that we can don't go do whatever we want. No, we, and when we enter into a relationship with God, when we accept his forgiveness on our behalf and his payment for our sins, it's not about, okay, I'm forgiven and I just keep sinning. No, 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 why sin like that grace may abound? No, we enter into a relationship with God and we begin to try to reflect him and to be like him because he is worthy of imitating. And as beloved children, we want to do that. We want to imitate God. And so in closing here, I want us to turn to Isaiah 53. And I want to read Isaiah 53 and see what it says about this event in history. And so I'd encourage you, as I read this to us, just close your eyes and listen to what Isaiah prophesied about this moment in history as we close here. Isaiah 53. Who has believed what he has heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground, he had no former majesty that we should look at him, and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows, and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him the chastisement that brought us peace and with wounds we are healed with his wounds we are healed all we like sheep have gone astray we have turned every one to his own way and the lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all he was afflicted and he he was oppressed and he was afflicted yet he opened not his mouth like a lamb that is led to the slaughter and like a sheep that is before its shears is silent so he opened not his mouth by oppression and judgment he was taken away and as for his generation who considered that he was cut off of the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people. And they made his grave with the wicked and with a rich man in his death, although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore I will divide him a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. See, our Jesus went to the cross for each one of us. He died in our place for our sins so that we could come into a relationship with him so that that curtain could be torn. And whether you or I are like the chief priests and the scribes and we lean on our own understanding and we struggle with that error, or we're like the men who nailed Jesus to the cross and we've lost sight of Christ on the cross and we've traded riches for rags, or like the two robbers actually guilty standing or being crucified between him. Or like Joseph of Arimathea seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness even though surround, he's surrounded by men who aren't loving the Lord and following the Lord. We can come to him. We have the opportunity to come to him and ask for forgiveness and enter into a relationship and watch that veil be torn on our behalf so that we can enter into a relationship with him. And so I'd encourage you today, if you haven't taken that step of faith, if you don't know the Lord, your Savior, I would ask, I would encourage you to pray that God would enter into your heart, enter into your life, and that you would begin to seek to follow him and seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. So let's pray as we close here. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the opportunity to talk about uh, your story, the gospel, and the resurrection. <laughs> and your crucifixion, and just all the amazing things that we can draw out of your word and what you have to teach us in that. And so I pray, God, that with the gospel fresh on our hearts and our minds, that we would go about our week focused on you and what you've done for us, 
and wanting to share that to the world around us, Lord. So I pray that this would have brought us encouragement and it would have convicted us and moved us to repentance and moved us into a deeper relationship with you, Lord. And so I thank you. I thank you for the Easter story. In Jesus' name, amen. Happy Easter, everyone. Have a great day.